Hey everybody, this is Rust from Metro Game Core. Today we're going to review the Aya Neo Air 1S. Now this is a handheld PC that might look familiar because there have been other versions released in the past. This one here is modeled after the original Aya Neo Air and Air Pro, which came out last year, and they share all the same traits. So for example, a five and a half inch OLED panel. This is still the only mini PC or handheld PC that has a built-in OLED display. In addition, there were other Aya Neo Air devices like the Air Plus, which came out. That one had a little bit larger of a screen. It was six inches, but it was an LCD. And then also they're working on another one called the Aya Neo Air Pocket. That's gonna be an Android based device that should be coming out here pretty soon. Now, the thing that separates this device from the others is that this one has the new Ryzen 7 7840U chipset inside. That's a super powerful APU that we found in a lot of other handheld PCs that I've reviewed here on this channel previously. Now, the great thing about the 7840U is that it can play just about anything you can think of. Even AAA PC games are playable, maybe not at a full 1080p 60 frames per second, but still you can get some really good gameplay out of devices like this. However, this is a little bit different. This one is so small that it can't really dissipate heat very well, and it has a smallish battery. You know, it's a concession that had to be made to make a handheld so small and portable. But here's the kicker. That's why this device is so interesting. The 7840U is a very efficient chipset. That means that you can play a lot of games at a lower power profile than you could previously. And that's a perfect fit for this device here. That means we can play a lot of lightweight and even some like middleweight PC games very easily on this device with some good battery life as well. And so all of a sudden, I found myself thinking of this device as being the very first Ionio Air that actually makes sense. Not only will it play a lot of games, but it'll save you on that battery life, and so it can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with other devices like the Steam Deck and the ROG Ally in terms of value and use case. Anyway, as you can imagine, we got a lot of ground to cover, so without any further delay, let's go ahead and dive right in. Okay, let's go ahead and get started with the specs. Like I mentioned, this has the Ryzen 7 7840U chipset inside, which is the most powerful processor that we can get today with integrated graphics. This also is using LPDDR5X RAM running at 6400 megatransfers per second. That's a little bit slower than some of the high-end devices like the One X Fly, but still very fast. And depending on the configuration, you can have between 16 and 32 gigs of RAM. The one I'm testing today does have 32. Another benefit is this device uses a full-size 2280 M.2 drive. And you also have some choice here between 512 gigs or up to four terabytes. Now the display is probably one of the biggest features of this device. It's five and a half inches with a 1080p resolution, but it is an OLED panel. As you'll see throughout this video, it has some really nice colors and very deep blacks. There are two different models for this device. There's a thin model and then a larger one or the standard size of 38 watt hours. And I'm testing with a 38 watt hour battery. And honestly, I do not recommend getting the thin one. That battery is just way too small for the kind of power that you need to push. In terms of weight, it's gonna be about 450 grams with that larger battery. It will get down to like 400 grams with the smaller one, but again, I don't really recommend that. This device also comes with two USB 4 ports as well as a three and a half millimeter headphone jack. And the operating system here is going to be Windows 11. And additionally, this is the first Aya Neo device that I've tested that is running on Aya Space 2. This is an updated version of their software, so we'll go into that here in this video. Now, this device is currently on offer on Indiegogo, so you can go ahead and pick it up right now, but it won't be shipping until later on this year. And there's quite a bit of range when it comes to the pricing, although these are relatively expensive. The absolute cheapest you'll be able to find it is $7.99, and that's only the early bird price on the Indiegogo campaign. That's only available for 100 units each of the white and black model. In reality, you're looking at a base model price of about $850 before it goes to retail, and then it'll go to $900. And if you want to include additional RAM or storage, you will be paying a price for that as well. So in a nutshell, yes, this is a big investment here. We're looking at something that's very close to the $1,000 price point. And when you compare it to other devices like the Steam Deck, pound for pound, it really can't keep up. We are looking at a $399 starting price for the Steam Deck here. And even if you get the Steam Deck with the most storage, it's still gonna be quite cheaper than the low-end Aya Neo Air. And if you were lucky enough to get one of these new refurbished models that they're now offering, you would have gotten even more of a deal. And it's a similar story with the ROG Ally. This one comes in at $699. But there are quite a few benefits with this one. For example, you can just go over to Best Buy and pick one up right now. And if anything goes wrong with it, it'll be a very easy return. So when it comes down to it, pound for pound, the Ioneo Air 1S cannot keep up in terms of price with the ROG Ally and especially the Steam Deck. 
And this has been the exact same case with all the other handheld PCs that have released from these smaller Chinese companies over the past couple of years. But one of the points I'll be making in this video here is I still think that there is a use case for the iNeo Air 1S. And a lot of that comes down to the sheer size and portability compared to those larger and cheaper handhelds. So let's move on and actually talk a little bit about what you can expect in terms of just the overall use of having an iNeo Air 1S. In addition to being quite small, there are some nice upgrades here as well. For example, this is using Hall Sensor Sticks. Now, these sticks themselves are relatively small, but all the same, they are nice and accurate. Same thing with the trigger buttons here on the back. These are also Hall Sensors, so very accurate and have a nice gliding feel to them. I love the fact that we have not one, but two different USB 4 ports, both on the top and the bottom. For example, it's very easy to dock this device and then still have a USB port available. Now the face buttons here are rubber membranes. That means they are going to have a nice classic retro feel to them. They're a little bit mushy, but still very responsive. My only complaint about these, and it was the same with the previous models, is the buttons themselves feel a little bit small. As you can see here, they're about 7mm altogether. In fact, they're a little bit smaller than what you would find on a Nintendo Switch or Switch Lite. Now on the left side we have our D-pad. This also has a rubber membrane connection, a very classic and retro feel. And like with the face buttons, this does have a bit of a mushy feel to it, but I think it's still very responsive and springy, so I do actually like this D-pad. My main complaint here would be that the pivot itself, when you roll it around on its axis, does feel a little bit stiff. And this can be a good or a bad thing depending on the type of game that you're playing. I think it works really well with platformers. For example, if we do the Contra test where we press all the way down on the D-pad and then try to rock it back and forth, you can see that the character does move a little bit, but it is minimally so. This means that as you're playing, you probably won't get any sort of accidental diagonals. However, I've found this can be a bad thing with certain types of games, like Street Fighter games. Because it's a little bit more difficult to hit those diagonals, I found that it's pretty easy to throw like a hurricane kick or a fireball, but when it comes to trying to do a dragon punch or a shoryuken, it actually isn't very easy. I would say I only had about a 10% success rate with that move. So in particular, if you're trying to play Capcom style fighting games with a D-pad on this device, I don't think it's going to be a great time. I would say that this is a Hadoukenable, but not Shoryukenable D-pad. However, in all other use cases, I found that the D-pad was absolutely serviceable. Now let's go ahead and take a look at the back here. So one of the main things that stand out from it are the ergonomics. The Ioneo Air devices do have a protruding grip on them, but it is a little bit shallow, especially when you get the thicker model like the one that I'm using here. Overall, you're definitely going to feel those grips and they are a bit comfortable, but one of the major ergonomic issues with the Ioneo Air devices is that they just feel a little bit short. Again, this is a small handheld, so it does make sense. However, in practical use, I've found that at least with my medium-sized hands, I never really find a place to put my pinkies. And that's going to be especially bad when playing first-person shooters where you angle your fingers more towards the triggers than anything. That specific angle is especially hard on my pinkies, and I've never really found it to be comfortable for more than about an hour of gaming. Now, don't get me wrong, I think this is still a relatively ergonomic design overall, and there's not a lot of room to work with given the fact that they have such a small device. And if you're mostly going to be focusing on just the analog sticks, the D-pad, and the face buttons, it is a very comfortable experience. It really comes into play when you start focusing on those triggers. In the end, this is still a device I would consider to be comfortable, but the ergonomics do keep me from wanting to use this as my primary device. If anything, I would say there are plenty of other devices that are more comfortable, but many of the more comfortable comfortable devices like the Steam Deck, the ROG Ally, and the One X Fly are more comfortable because they're bigger. So if your primary concern is having something that is small and pocketable, I'm here to say that there are some compromises in the design. And overall, I don't think it's a completely negative thing. It's just really something to consider if you do have larger hands but still want a smaller handheld. Now in terms of the unboxing experience, it's almost identical to the original iNeo Air devices. In fact, all they've done is just slapped a sticker here on the front. Inside, all the accessories are the same. So we have some USB-A, USB-C converters, and then we have our power brick and a bunch of international plugs, and they've covered every single continent. For example, this one here is for Antarctica. And the power brick itself is rated for 65 watts, and it's nice and compact as well. Now inside they've added a warning sheet, basically saying that anything above 18 watt TDP is going to feel pretty warm to the touch. In addition, it says that in battery mode it's only going to have a max of 20 watt TDP. Anyway, yeah, that's about what you can expect when it comes to the unboxing experience here, very similar to the original iNeo Air devices. Now a couple housekeeping things that I didn't mention previously, so for example here on the bottom left are your start and select buttons. These have a nice soft kind of click to them. 
And on the opposite side, we have a show desktop button as well as the IS space button. Also up top, we have two different programmable hotkeys. We'll go into that here in a minute when I show off the software. And personally, I'm a big fan of these. They're easy to reach, but then also don't really stick out from the design either. Additionally, up top, we have our ventilation for the fan, our volume rocker up and down, and then our power button, which also is a fingerprint sensor. And I would say maybe three quarters of the time it is able to accurately pick up my fingerprint. One of the main questions I get about this device is the fan noise. Let's go ahead and take a listen here at full speed. Overall, I would say it's relatively loud for a small device, but the pitch of the fan is not too bad. And for me, I found that about 50% volume is enough to mask that overall fan noise, and it's pretty good at that point. So overall, I would say that the fan noise here is definitely audible, but not to the point where I think it's a big problem. Moving over to the bottom here, let's talk about those speakers. So these are dual stereo speakers that are down firing. And in previous iNeo Air devices, I found the sound quality to be usually lacking. It's very muffled and low. Let's go ahead and take a listen right here. So my gut reaction here is that it still feels relatively muffled, but better than it was before. And there are third party tools like FX Sound that you can use, which will improve the sound quality, which is what I've done on other iNeo Air devices. So I do want to acknowledge here that the sound quality has improved, but I still don't think it's something to write home about. And then finally, we have our micro SD card slot. This is thankfully on the bottom, so it's not going to cause any heat issues. In fact, all of my PC games that I tested are running from a micro SD card here in this video. Now to really understand the small size of this device, we have to do some pretty thorough comparisons. So let's just go ahead and pull out a bunch of different handheld PCs and go from smallest to largest. To start here is the GPD Win 4. This one is about the same size, but much thicker than the iNeo Air. And as I'll show here in a moment, it's nearly 50% heavier as well. Next up, we have the AYN Loki Max. This one's using the Ryzen 7 6800U, which is last year's model. So in terms of performance, this one is a little bit less. As you can see, this one's a little bit bigger, but more comfortable thanks to that larger size. Next up is the One X Fly. I would still consider this to be a smallish device, but this one is significantly more comfortable over long time use compared to the iNeo Air 1S. The way I would summarize it is that the One X Fly is the absolute smallest device that I've used that doesn't really feel like a compromise in terms of ergonomics and controls. And as you can see, the screen here is quite a bit larger at 7 inches. In a similar vein, here is the iNeo 2S. This one is also 7 inches, but a 16 by 10 aspect ratio. Next up is the ROG Ally, also a 7 inch screen, but 16 by 9. And of course, we have to compare it against the Steam Deck, which as you can see, just absolutely dwarfs the 1S. Same thing with the AOK Zoe A1 Pro with its 8 inch screen. Now, even though this is the thicker iNeo Air model, it's still quite a bit lighter than the others. It's over 100 grams lighter than the Loki Max and the One X Fly, and it's a full 150 grams lighter than the GPD Win 4 and the ROG Ally. And as you can imagine, as the size increases, the gap between the weights is going to increase even more. And I think this is one of the main selling points of the iNeo Air 1S. Yes, it's more expensive than the others, but it is much lighter and more portable. And so if that is high on your priority list, then this might make more sense. Now it's not super small, for example, I wouldn't consider this to be a pocketable handheld PC, but still I think it's very impressive to have this amount of power and performance in a form factor so small. In fact, one of the better size comparisons is going to be the Nintendo Switch Lite, which is taller and wider than the iNeo Air 1S. To put it in a more practical context, even when using a case for this device, it is still supremely portable and small. For example, here's the iNeo Air 1S inside of a case, and it is still much smaller and lighter than the ROG Ally. Anyway, I think I've made my point here. Yes, this is a very small device. Next, I want to move on to software. We're going to talk about the iSpace 2 app, which is now available for this device and is coming for the other ones as well. And they've reworked this app from the ground up, and I'm really happy to see it because I was not a huge fan of the original iSpace app. Now, in terms of functions, this is very similar to the previous one. We have two different ways to browse your games. We have this front page kind of menu right here, which actually looks pretty good. And this will basically detect any of the games that you have installed, either from Steam or any other launcher. Now, it also still has that traditional grid style view, which you can find under the Installed Games tab. 
So this will be handy if you plan on having multiple games from various different stores. Additionally, they have revamped the settings menu, which you can now pull from the side. And there are quite a few improvements overall. Most of them have to do with the performance section. Up here on the top, you can see it's very easy to set an FPS limit just from the slider. In addition, there's now a slider for the TDP, so it's very easy to go between 5 and 20 watts on battery or a full 25 when you have it plugged in. But perhaps most importantly, they now have a smart TDP function. Essentially, this will work like an auto TDP, so it'll adjust the power profile depending on what the game requires. And for me, this is a game changer. We'll talk about that more later in the video when we actually get into the gameplay testing. Additionally, within here, we have some of the same functions, so the ability to change the fan configuration, and you can also lock the CPU and GPU clock speeds as well. The other setting category of note is going to be the controller section, and a lot of this is similar to what it was on the original iOS Space app, but just more refined. So within here, you can adjust things like the joystick stick or trigger sensitivity, as well as turning off any sort of dead zone. Additionally, you can make changes to things like the vibration as well as the gyro. Below that, you can recalibrate your joysticks and buttons, and now you can also program that bottom right button. It is going to show the desktop by default, but you can change it to another option if you like. Additionally, within this section, you can also adjust the RGB lighting around the joysticks. This is the same as how it was in the original IS Space app. And same thing here with programming the shoulder keys. And one of the best features here is you can now set it to close a program if you'd like. One of the other things that is new with the IS Space 2 app is the quick menu. This one's also been redeveloped from the ground up and has those same sliders and really most of the same functions that you find in the main app. However, this will come up over your game, so it's very easy to be able to make these adjustments without having to back out of your game and go into a different app. And I'm happy to report that I've found a lot fewer bugs with IS Space 2 compared to the original one. Now, like I mentioned before, the Smart TDP function has been a game changer for me within IS Space 2. And that's because out of the box, this makes it a very seamless experience when it comes to a power profile. In fact, for all the testing that I do in this video here, all I did was set it to smart and then let the device take care of the rest. And this has improved my overall quality of life when using a Windows-based handheld PC more than any of the others that I've tested. In fact, the only other handheld PC that is basically set and forget like this is going to be the Steam Deck. Now, if you want, you can still make power profiles. These are very similar to what you can find with the ROG Ally, and you can tweak them however you'd like. And you'll probably squeeze out a little bit better performance that way. But for me personally, I would rather have a set and forget experience. Another addition to IS Space 2 are built-in performance measurements. And so I'll be using that in this video here as well. Let me walk you through that real quick. So on the top left, we have our graphics backend, then the resolution and frames per second. And then we have our CPU and GPU utilization as well as temperature. On the far right on the top here, we also have our overall fan speed. And this can go up to about 5300 RPM altogether. On the bottom left, we have our RAM utilization and then our power menu here in the center. That'll include the power profile and then the battery draw, which is the negative number, and then also our percentage and minutes of battery remaining. And then on the far right, we have our current time. Now, when it comes to actually playing games and the setup for it, I typically will just use Steam Big Picture Mode, and that's what I've done here. I did go a little bit above and beyond, so in addition to the installed games that I have on my SD card, I also used EmuDeck for Windows to set up all of my emulated games as well. So all the gameplay that you're going to see here within Windows is going to be via Steam, so not only will my PC games be doing that, but then also my emulated systems. And really, that's about it when it comes to my setup. I try to keep things as simple as possible, especially here within Windows, where things can get complicated very fast. And overall, I've been very happy with this user experience. It's very similar to what you can find on the Steam Deck, especially when you factor in that smart TDP, which will adjust our power profile on the fly. Okay, now let's move into game testing. I'm going to do things a little bit differently. Usually I will talk about the TDP that I set for each of these individual games, but because we're using that smart TDP, I don't have to do any of that. Instead, I'll talk about the games that I played and what the computer itself determined to be the correct power profile for each of them. Now for the most lightweight games I could play, you know, things like Celeste and SteamWorld Dig 2, I did get a power profile of about 6 watt TDP. However, the games that had this low of a power profile were kind of few and far between. Instead, I found that with most lightweight games, the Goldilocks range was between 7 and 8 watts altogether. And this is great for a few reasons. Number one, at a low power profile like this, the device will not actually get physically hot. In fact, it really doesn't get warm until about 13 to 15 watts altogether. 
The other great thing about this is that at this lower TDP, you're going to be able to get some pretty great battery life. As we'll show in my battery life testing, at about 8 watts, you're going to get very close to 3 hours of gameplay altogether. And for an x86-based device of this size and small battery, that's pretty awesome. And I think this is exactly where the iNeo Air 1S really shines. I feel like this device has always been well-suited for lightweight and indie games, but it's never really worked because of the CPU inside. For example, the chip within the original iNeo Air devices was not very efficient, and so because of that, you had to run it at a higher TDP. And of course, that would make the battery life plummet. And to me, this is the first time we found a good balance between having a small size device with decent battery life thanks to the efficiency of the CPU. Now, this device is capable of playing way more than just lightweight games. So if you want to up it just a little bit, you can play games like Hades or Risk of Rain 2. And these will generally run at about 11 or 12 watts. Games from the Xbox 360 or PS3 era will also play very well at about 13 watts altogether, but at a 1080p resolution. However, as you start dipping your toes into AAA games, you will have to make some compromises. For example, Horizon Zero Dawn works the best at a 720p on low settings, which honestly with the OLED panel still looks great, but I would say to get a consistent frame rate, you're probably going to want to cap it at 30 frames per second. That'll give you an average of about 16 watt TDP, which is still pretty impressive for this game. It's a similar story with Destiny 2. This is definitely going to be a compromise because I prefer to play this at a 60 frames per second cap, but I found that the game is very playable still at 40 frames per second, and that'll demand about a 15-16 watt TDP as well. Of course, if you want to really push it, you still can. So for example, with Witcher 3, 720p in low settings, I can get very close to a consistent 60 frames per second. However, this will take the full 20 watt TDP that you're allowed on battery power. And one note here is that the smart TDP function is not perfect and infallible. We'll talk about it a little bit more when it comes to emulation, but even with some lightweight PC games, they're just not very well optimized. So for example, with Omno, this one will pull a full 20 watt TDP. In fact, it's pushing the GPU harder than it was with Destiny 2. Now, even though 20 watts is the max you can get on battery, it's not the max that you can get while plugged in. So we're going to use Marvel Spider-Man as our example. We're playing it at 720p and low settings with FSR on. And I'd say the average here is about maybe 34, 35 frames per second. It's really not that bad. But next we're going to plug it in. Now this is at 100% battery, which means it's not going to be pulling the battery at all. And so even though the chip is going to heat up, we're not going to get additional heat from that battery. It's just going to be running off of mains. And when it's plugged in, it'll push it all the way up to 25 watts. And this is going to give us better performance here with Spider-Man, but not by much. I would say the average here is about 40, maybe 42 frames per second. And again, this is a bit of a compromise because on other devices with this chipset, they go well over 25 watt TDP. Most of them are at 30 or above. Okay, next up, let's move over to emulation. We're going to start with the easy stuff here just to see what the power demands are going to be. And this is actually very similar to the indie games. No matter how lightweight the game is, it still requires about a 7 watt TDP altogether. And as you start moving up, it will go up in like 1 watt increments. For example, with Super Nintendo here, it goes between like a 7 and an 8 watt TDP. Same thing with Sega Genesis. And we'll talk about this more in detail in a later section, but this will give us about three hours of battery life altogether, which I still think is pretty decent. But the real magic's going to happen at those higher TDPs with the more demanding systems. For example, Sega Saturn, which is much harder to play than something like Super Nintendo, only requires about a 9 watt TDP. So with an additional 1 watt, we're able to play a system that is much harder than the 16-bit ones. Another good example is PlayStation Portable. I'm running this at a 4x resolution. That means it's running at 1080p. But even then, depending on the game, Game, it's only going to demand about 7 or 8 watts altogether. So it's the same power demand as the Super Nintendo. Now other games that are more demanding like God of War here are going to require like a 9 or a 10 watt, but even then it's still not a lot. And surprisingly, it's a similar story with Nintendo GameCube and PlayStation 2. Many games will run at a 7 or 8 watt TDP. As you get into the more demanding games, you will see it go up to maybe 9 or 10 watts. But even then, I would say it's very playable here and this is running at a 1080p resolution again. Now, like I mentioned in the PC games section, there is some limits to the smart TDP. For example, this feature will disable the CPU turbo, and that is required with certain games. For example, F-Zero GX will not run at full speed. So you got a couple options here. You can either manually turn on that CPU turbo for this game in particular, or you could set the emulated CPU speed to something like 200 or 300%, and that might take care of the problem as well. Long story short, when it comes to Gen 6 consoles like GameCube and PS2, most of them are going to run absolutely no problem here when 
using Smart TDP. There may be some outliers where you'll have to manually configure the power profile. Additionally, I found that with some PS2 games that are more demanding, they will require a higher TDP, usually around 13 watts of the max. Again, I still think that's perfectly acceptable, and also bear in mind that I'm upscaling here a 3x resolution or 1080p. Another console that runs really well on this system is Nintendo Wii U. I found an average of about 10 or 11 watts plays most games at full speed. Bear in mind this is a native resolution which means that it could be running in either 720p or 1080p depending on the game. But a good indication here that Wii U is comfortably playable is Breath of the Wild. This is easily the most demanding game on the system and it requires a power draw of about 14 or 15 watts to hit a 40 frames per second cap. And for me, I would say this is perfectly acceptable in terms of performance and graphical fidelity. Another system that runs really well with this chipset is PlayStation 3. In fact, when it comes to lightweight PS3 games, most of these will play at between maybe 10 or 11 watts using the Smart TDP function. And that's really impressive considering the fact that there are PS2 games that demand more than that. Now, when you get into the more heavyweight games, you will see the power profile go up quite a bit. But even then, I found that the max was 17 watts, and so it didn't even reach that 20 watt cap that is here on battery power. And it didn't matter how heavy weight of a game I threw at it, even something like Ratchet & Clank Quest for Booty did play very well. Now I would say probably the most demanding PS3 game, something like God of War 3, is probably not going to be in the realm of possible here. But all the same, I'm comfortable in saying that this is going to be a very PS3 emulation friendly device. And playing these games on that OLED panel is just really amazing. Now one console I found didn't play very well is Xbox 360. This one actually would push to 20 watts and sometimes even beyond in Smart TDP. And even then, it struggled to maintain a good frame rate. In addition, some of the games I tested, like Crackdown, wouldn't boot past the main loading screen. So I think if you're going to buy this device specifically for Xbox 360, I would say this is probably not a good fit. And finally, the other emulated system that has somewhat mixed results is the Nintendo Switch. I found that in docked mode, it really couldn't keep up, but if you put it into handheld mode, it did play pretty well. Of course, it's really going to come down to the game, but I found that both lightweight and middleweight games played absolutely no problem, all the way up to Mario Kart 8 Deluxe. Some of the more heavyweight games like Link's Awakening or Mario Odyssey did struggle to maintain 60 frames per second. So if you want to have absolutely zero slowdown, this may not be a great fit right here. However, one trick you could do, like with PC games, is you could plug it in instead and play it on a monitor. This will give you a more consistent frame rate. In fact, Link's Awakening was a pretty stable 60 frames per second when I had it plugged in. But bear in mind that I'm still playing it in handheld mode here, so it's not going to look super great on a very big screen. So I would say that yes, Nintendo Switch is playable on here, but you will have to be choosy which games you actually want to play. Now, another thing I wanted to test is a Linux-based operating system. Today, we're actually going to be using Jealous, and we're booting it here from a USB-C drive that I have up on top. This operating system should be able to boot from the SD card, but unfortunately I was not able to get it working. Regardless, it was pretty easy to set all this up. I just had to flash the operating system to this flash drive, then plug it in, and then boot into the drive. From there, I just had to load up all of my games, and then here we are with a retro game-focused emulation system that's running on Linux. And I would say performance here is very similar to what I was finding on Windows as well. So this might be a great solution if you want to keep your PC games specifically on Windows, but then want to play all your retro emulation off of a flash drive here in Linux. And even though a lot of people associate this operating system with low-end hardware, you know, like from Ambernick or Palkitty, the x86 version of this operating system works on a number of different handhelds and PCs. And there are some pretty exciting options when using it on a handheld. Within the system configurations, you can make a bunch of adjustments. For example, if you'd like to park certain threads so that you can save on battery life, you can do that. And you can also adjust the fan profile and max TDP. And these are settings I've been hoping to find in Bodicera over time, but as it stands right now, Jealous is the only Linux-based operating system that I've seen working with handhelds like this. Now, the team hasn't been able to test on this specific device yet, and so things like audio just aren't working quite yet. But if they're able to get their hands on some dev units in the future, I think this might be something that we'll be able to use in the coming months. Okay, and last section, let's talk about the real-world battery life that I experienced over the week of testing that I had with this device. To start, I want to pull your attention to the top right. I found that charging it from 0 to 100 took 1 hour and 24 minutes, which is not bad at all. In addition, I found that it only lost 1% of battery in an overnight sleep mode. 
Now for all this battery testing, I use that smart TDP function. So all this is gonna have an average TDP because it would fluctuate depending on the game. So starting on the far right with Celeste here, you can see that we got an average of about six watt TDP. And at that six watt power profile, I got a little bit over four hours of battery life, which is pretty impressive considering the size of this device. But I think a better average is gonna be about eight watt TDP. Most lightweight PC games are gonna run right about there. And as you can see, that got me a little bit under three hours of battery life altogether. Moving on from there, I would say middleweight games like Hades, as well as emulated systems like Wii U, ran at an average of 11 watts. And that gave me two hours and 17 minutes of battery life altogether. Now moving on to AAA games, I found that most of them had to be compromised down to a lower resolution. So for example, Horizon Zero Dawn required 720p and low settings. And at a 30 frames per second lock, we got an average of 16 watts, which gave me an hour and a half of battery life. And then finally, on the far end of the spectrum, or a worst case scenario here, is going to be Marvel Spider-Man. And this one gave me an average of one hour and 22 minutes. So I think it's safe to say that at a worst case scenario, you're probably going to get a little bit over an hour of battery life. But the more realistic average, especially considering the type of games that are going to work best on this device, is going to be between two and three hours of battery life altogether. And for me, I think this is the sweet spot, the ability to use that smart TDP to regulate everything. So that way, when you're in a lightweight scene, it's going to go down. But then when you're playing something more heavyweight, it'll go up a little bit more. Not only will this give you a fairly optimized battery life, but it's just also going to prevent you from having to go into the settings and adjust things left and right. That's always been one of my biggest complaints about using a handheld Windows-based PC. And like I mentioned earlier in this video, this is the very first Windows-based handheld that actually feels plug and play. I literally didn't do anything else other than turn it on and then turn on the smart TDP and then just let it play from there. Okay, and so with all that testing out of the way, let's go ahead and start wrapping things up and talk about what I like and what I don't like about the iNeo Air 1S. We'll start with what I like. Number one is going to be the size and portability. I've always liked how small this device is. And I'm also a big fan of the OLED panel. It's a little bit small. I wish it was six inches altogether. But when it comes to the color profile and the sharpness, I really can't complain. This is an excellent screen. I also think the controls are decent. I wish the buttons were a little bit bigger, but that's a minor complaint. And I spent a lot of this video talking about how efficient the 7840U chip is and why that really matters for this device in particular. Additionally, I think that iNeo has done a great job with IS Space 2. Specifically, I really like that smart TDP function, which gives it a more plug and play experience. And overall, I feel like the iNeo Air 1S finally makes sense. Now we have a device that's super small with a great screen, but also an efficient chip, which will give us better battery life. Of course, it's not going to be able to stand toe to toe with those devices that have larger batteries, but I still think that among all of the other iNeo Air devices, this one here feels the most balanced. Now, of course, it's not perfect, so let's talk about some of the things I don't like about this device. Number one, I already talked about these small buttons, but also the audio quality is a little bit of a letdown. It is better than I remember on the other Air devices, but all the same, I wish it was a little bit more crisp and clear. I also think the ergonomics are not perfect. In particular, I feel like the device is just a little bit squished feeling, and I never really know where to put my pinkies. Additionally, this is an expensive device. Now, I understand why the price is so high. After all, they're using a high-end chip, and there's also very high-end components inside. INEO also doesn't have the capital that some of the larger companies like Asus has to drive down the price. And of course, they can't subsidize their own costs like Valve can with the Steam Deck. In summary, I think there are compromises for having a device this small. And personally, I don't think that's a specific bad thing. If anything, it just means that you have to be very aware of what you're getting if you do plan on buying this device. Yes, you're going to pay more than other devices. And yes, the battery life is not going to last as long. But there are some really excellent trade-offs with the INEO Air 1S. For example, if you really want an OLED panel, this is the only device on the market right now with it. Or if you really just want to focus on lightweight PC games, you know, things like graphic novels or platformers, this is going to be a great fit. And it's nice to know that it is capable of playing AAA games and high-end emulation. So when it comes down to it, you're probably wondering whether or not I recommend this device for purchase. And I think this video here has probably given you all the tools that you need in order to make that decision yourself. For example, if you've always felt like the Steam Deck or other handheld PCs are too large, this might be a good balance. But of course, bear in mind that you will be paying a premium for that additional smaller size. Anyway, let me know what you think in the comments below. Is this finally the first iNeo Air device that gets everything right? Or should we be waiting for something else to come down the line? As always, thank you for watching, and be sure to like and subscribe if you found this helpful, and we will see you next time. Happy gaming.